Thank you, Mark, and good morning. We are continuing our studies in the Gospel of Mark. We're in chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 7 through 19. The Lord has healed a man in the synagogue on the Sabbath. It's a great miracle, but it became the occasion for the Pharisees to join with the, Sadu with the Herodians in a plot against Christ to destroy him. And so with that background, we read in verse 7, Jesus withdrew to the sea with his disciples, and a great multitude from Galilee followed, and also from Judea, and from Jerusalem, and from Idumea, and beyond the Jordan, and the vicinity of Tyre and Sidon. A great number of people heard of all that he was doing and came to him. And he told his disciples that a boat should stand ready for him because of the crowd so that they would not crowd him. For he had healed many with the result that all those who had afflictions pressed around him in order to touch him. Whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they would fall down before him and shout, You are the Son of God. And he earnestly warned them not to tell who he was. And he went up on the mountain and summoned those whom he himself wanted, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve so that they would be with him, and that he could send them out to preach and to have authority to cast out the demons. And he appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, and James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to them he gave the name Boanerges, which means sons of thunder, and Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. May the Lord bless this reading of His Word and bless our time of study in it together. Let's bow together in prayer. Psalm 133 begins, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. That is the ideal for God's people, brothers and sisters being in a family. Ultimately, this will happen in the kingdom to come. But even now, it's, it's what we strive for. And it has happened. Brothers dwelling together. Last week I quoted Augustine's Confessions. Before he wrote that book, and after his conversion, he formed a small fellowship in North Africa where he had his long ministry. It was a group of fellow believers who devoted themselves to study and learned conversation which they shared around a table where they took their meals together. It was a warm fellowship. There are other examples of that kind of fellowship in the church. Luther had his famous table talks with his students. Those brothers would have called those times good and pleasant but I can't imagine a more pleasant fellowship than the one formed in Mark 3, when the Lord calls His twelve disciples into a close community to, as verse 14 says, be with Him. What a time that must have been, taking their meals with Christ, walking along the dusty roads with Him, observing His life, being able to ask questions at any time and get the wisest answers. And what an effect all of that would have had on them. It's Proverbs 13, verse 20. He who walks with wise men will be wise. They needed to be wise. It had become necessary to form such a community. The religious leaders opposed him and had formed a conspiracy against him, one to destroy him. And it would result in his rejection and death. That's one reason he formed this fellowship, to prepare them to carry on his work. 
Jesus knew that his time was limited. He knew the, the, the hearts and plans of his opponents. He didn't resist them. He didn't seek to thwart them, not aggressively, not actively. Instead, Mark wrote in verse 7, Jesus withdrew to the sea with his disciples. Now, he didn't do that out of fear. He had the power to deal with any of them. He had cast out demons. He had made the lame to walk and restored a man's withered hand. He could have crushed their opposition easily. But that was not his purpose. He had not come into this world to be the emperor of the world, but to be the savior of the world. He came to die, as he will say later in chapter 10, to give his life a ransom for many. And the path to that, the path to the cross followed a plan. It was a careful and wise plan. A collision with the authorities early in his ministry would have disrupted that plan and been counterproductive. So, he acted wisely to diffuse the hostility and quietly withdrew. Now, that's the mark of wisdom, to avoid friction and fighting when it can be avoided. That's what the Proverbs teach. The paths of wisdom are peace. And the Lord was the truest wise man. So he left the synagogue and the Pharisees for the sea. And soon was mobbed by crowds on the shore waiting to be healed. They didn't share the Pharisees' disdain for Jesus. They came from all over. Verse 7 mentions a great multitude from Galilee and also Judea. Well, that's the entire length of the land from Galilee in the north to Judea in the south. But the area represented by this crowd that came out for the Lord was far wider than that. We read in verse 8, And from Jerusalem and from Idumea and beyond the Jordan and the vicinity of Tyre and Sidon, a great number of people heard of all that he was doing and came to him. Well, that would include, it would seem, from the regions that are described there, very obviously, Gentiles among the Jews. The uncultured Galileans whose speech marked them out as uncouth, and the favored Judeans and the proud, privileged Jerusalemites are all there, but also men of Idumea, which is the Edomites, they came. The mention of whose name, someone said, froze the blood of the Jews. Their, their rivalry with the Edomites was ancient. It went back to Jacob and Esau. But they were there. They came together. There were people from beyond the Jordan. Bedouin tribes from the desert, as well as merchants and sailors from Tyre and Sidon on the Mediterranean coast of Lebanon, all came. It was a diverse multitude which came from the north and the south and the east, which showed how widely the Lord's reputation had spread in such a short time. And it foreshadowed the reach of the gospel that would go to the Gentiles as well as the Jews. But this multitude had not come for the gospel. They came for healing. And they were desperate. That's indicated from verse 9 where the Lord expressed a concern that the people not crowd him. The word means press upon. It even means afflict. In verse 10 they pressed around him in order to touch him. And really, it's, more, uh, it's much more aggressive in the original text than we have in the, in the English text. It means literally to fall upon him. The large crowds can be dangerous. People get crushed in them. And this had the potential for that. These people were desperate for healing. As, as we can well understand, the, uh, the word that's used for their sickness and their, their afflictions in verse 10 gives us a sense of that. It's the word for a whip or a lash or a scourge that indicates the, the sting of it, the torment of the diseases that these individuals had. 
But they knew that he could heal them. So, eager for that, frantic to be healed, they pressed against him. And aware of the possible danger, he told the disciples to have a boat ready from which he could separate from the crowd. It's not clear that he used it. If he had, it would have been his pulpit on the sea. He was prepared to use it. Uh, in fact, he does use it, that very thing, at the beginning of chapter 4. But whether he uses it or not here, what this shows is he was always in control of the crowd. Uh, that lesson is here. He wouldn't let the crowd control him or press him. He guarded his physical condition. That's clear. But there may be more here than that, and I think there is, at least by way of application. Christ always guarded himself from being pressed by the crowds physically, but also spiritually. He knew how eager they were to press him into their service, and, and he knew the danger of that for himself. One British commentator, Harold St. John, suggested this idea and pointed out that a, a crowded life of work without time alone with God and seeking His help will rob a person of spiritual freshness, rob a person of vitality. We can allow our schedules to become so crowded, so controlling of us, even with good things, that our spiritual lives are smothered. The Lord never allowed that to happen. He didn't let the people so press Him that it robbed Him of His time with His Father, or press Him into the service that they wanted to make Him King, the Messiah they wanted, a healer and provider. Those were the pressures that were on Him. And there are, are few things that can have a stronger influence over a person than popular acclaim. The allure of celebrity is, is st very strong. It's as strong as any narcotic. Not many people can resist it. And those who don't, not many people can live with it. Voltaire, the father of the Enlightenment, who was adored by the rich and powerful of Europe, admitted to his doctor when he was dying, all my life I have swallowed nothing but smoke. That's really what fame or anything that the world has to offer is. Riches, whatever it may be, it's all smoke. It's there for a moment, but only for a moment. And then it's gone. Well, Jesus never swallowed smoke. Jesus was never dazzled by the crowds and their enthusiasm. He knew the nature of things. He knew the nature of this, this passing world and was single-minded about his relationship with his Father and single-minded about his mission. We, we see that elsewhere. John chapter 6 is a very good example of that. He feeds the multitude, the 5,000, which is really... 5,000 plus, 10, 15, 20,000 people perhaps when ad, one adds up all the women and children that were there with the men. And with a few loaves and fishes, he fed them. And there was much left over. And they wanted him to be their king. And they wanted him ever to give them this bread. And so what's he do? He dismisses his disciples, sends them out on the sea to get them separated because he knew how influenced they would be, and he dismissed the crowd because that was not his mission. His mission was not to be the kind of a Messiah they wanted. He controlled the crowds so that he would not be distracted from his spiritual life and his purpose, and he still ministered to them with compassion and efficiency. He healed many of them. He healed all of them their afflictions, their, their physical diseases, and delivered them from their demons. Whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they would fall down before him and shout, You are the Son of God. What they meant by the Son of God was what Mark meant in the first verse of this gospel. He is the eternal Son of God. This is what terrified them. 
God, their creator and their judge had come to them. And they dreaded that. Later in, in chapter 6, the people will call Jesus the carpenter. That's all he was to them, really. Oh, he could fix their lives like he could fix a chair or a table, but he was a carpenter. He was a man and nothing more. The Pharisees accused him of being a blasphemer and a Sabbath breaker. He was only a man and a sinful man in their opinion. None of them knew who he was. Only the demons did. He is the Son of God. That's very revealing about the spiritual condition of the nation. This is the people of God. And they don't recognize their God. They don't recognize their Creator. They don't recognize their Savior. He's just a man. It's the demons. It's the unclean spirits that know the truth. What a commentary that is, not only on these Jews and these Israelites, but on mankind. We're blind in and of ourselves. The demons knew the truth. But the Lord wouldn't let them speak it. He earnestly warned them not to tell who He was. The Lord didn't give the reason for silencing the voices of the demons, but one reason I think is indicated a few verses down in verse 22 when the scribes accused the Lord of being in league with the devil. Now, if he had allowed the demons to be his evangelists, that would only have fueled the allegation and given support to what they were saying. But also, the nation wasn't ready for the revelation they were hearing from these unclean spirits. The people's notion of the Messiah was nationalistic. It was materialistic. They were expecting a political deliverer who would break the yoke of Rome. So before he revealed himself fully as the Christ, he needed to make clear he had come to suffer for the sins of his people and to deliver them from a far greater slavery, from spiritual slavery and from the judgment to come. And he would do that. He would give that revelation in his way and in his time and do so by the appropriate heralds Men set apart for that mission, not unclean spirits. And that is what the Lord provides for in the next verse when He sets apart twelve men to be His apostles and missionaries. He withdrew to a mountain somewhere in Galilee where He sovereignly summoned those whom He Himself, he himself wanted and they came to Him. Their names are listed in verses 16 through 19. It was a strategic development in his ministry. The crowds were large. The sick and possessed were numerous. The need for preaching widely was great. And the time was limited. So he authorized some of his followers to share in the work. But this statement in verse 13 that he summoned them is also revealing about the Lord and about His way, about how He does things. He took the initiative. He withdrew from the crowds, and He called only those He Himself wanted. The choice was His. The choice was according to His pleasure, according to His will. That's the emphasis here. He would later tell them in John chapter 15 and verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you would go and bear fruit. And they came to him, Mark wrote. They came because he chose. Now it might seem natural that his followers would respond to his call, but that's not the important thing here. They came because he called. They came because he chose. That's the power of of His Word. That's the power of His call. And while it was for ministry, it's also illustrative of His choice for salvation. In 1 John 4 verse 19, John wrote, we love because He first loved us. So we came because He first called. 
We respond because of His love for us. And here He chose and they followed. It was natural, but it was irresistible. That's the power of His will, of his will and His Word. The purpose of the calling is given in verses 14 and 15. And He appointed twelve so that they would be with Him and that He could send them out to preach and to have authority to cast out the demons. The order here is important. Before they would be able to preach and have power over the demons, they would need to be with Him. Their lives would first be grounded in a relationship with Him. It's similar to what He said earlier in chapter 1 and verse 17. Follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. It's as we follow Him and as we are with Him that we have power to live well and bear fruit for Him. This is how He prepared them to live wisely and serve faithfully in a hostile world. A world that is constantly trying, would, would be constantly trying to press them and is constantly trying to press us into its image, to conform to its will and its purpose, to rob us of the mission we've been given. It is a hostile world, and this is how He prepared them for that, through personal fellowship. So this statement of His purpose for calling them so that they would be with Him is significant. The Christian life is about bearing witness to Christ and His saving grace. It is about bearing fruit for Him in a variety of ways, the fruit of the Spirit, personal fruit, virtues that come out of us, but also deeds that we do. The Christian life is about doing. The Christian life is active. The Christian life involves responsibility and discipline. All of that. But it's not just that. In fact, it's not basically that. Fundamentally, the Christian life is a relationship with God. It's about knowing Him. That's how Jesus defined eternal life in John 17, verse 3. That they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. It is knowing God. When He calls a person to Himself to be His disciple, His follower, a believer, He has called us first and foremost to be His child, His son or daughter, His friend. He's called us into a relationship. There's no greater blessing or privilege than that. No greater blessing than to be associated with a friend of, a close friend of, the Lord God Almighty. Think of that. If you've been called into the family of God, if, you are, if you've been brought to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, if you have put your faith in Him, you are joined to the God of the universe, to the triune God. That is the greatest of all privileges. And as we know Him, increasingly we become like Him. When people move from one region of the country to another or to another part of the world, they often take on the characteristics of that place. If a person moves to London, eventually he or she will be talking with a British accent. And it's not the result of a studied, planned change. It is subtle, and over time it's inevitable. It happens. And so it is with Christians. As we walk with the Lord, we become like Him. We begin to talk like Him. We begin to think like Him. We begin to desire the things that He desires. His will becomes our will. We become Christ-like. He who walks with wise men will be wise. So it is true, if you want to live better, if you want to live wisely, walk with the Lord. Be with Him. Now I must say that almost seems pragmatic. And what I mean by that is having, having a relationship with the Lord is good for you. Therefore, get to know Jesus because it's good for self-improvement. 
Now, I, I think that's true. It is. I've been saying that. But more than that, knowing Christ is a blessing all its own. Knowing Him is reason in and of itself for knowing Him. Genesis 5 recalls Enoch. It says that Enoch walked with God for 300 years. Why? How do you account for that long walk? It's because he loved him. And that's the unspoken reason for that long walk. Enoch loved the Lord. Why is it that you like to spend time with your family, with your children or your grandchildren? Why is it that you like to spend time with your very close friends? You say, well, it, it, surely uh, there's an advantage in doing that, but that's not why you do it. You spend time with them because you love them, and that in and of itself is the reason. Cer certainly there will be an advantage to having a good friend if that friend is wise. As our iron sharpens iron, so one man another. There's great advantage in being with, with friends and family, but that's not basically the reason we, we do that. We have these associations and we're drawn to them naturally because we love those we spend time with. And this is the relationship the Lord built with His disciples. He called 12 of them to Himself so that first and foremost they would be with Him, having fellowship with Him. The Pharisees didn't want to be with Him. They wanted to destroy Him. The crowds wanted to be with Him, but for their own reasons. The disciples wanted to be with Him because they loved Him, and they loved Him only because of sovereign grace. He chose them and called them into a relationship with Him, and being with Him, He would transform them. He would empower them. He did Enoch. He walked with God and Jude says he was a great prophet in the days before the flood. These men would be used of God too. They would preach and they would defeat demons. Their names are listed in verses 16 through 19. We'll look at them briefly. The first is Simon to whom he gave the name Peter. A name which, you know, means rock. A rock is stable. It didn't seem to characterize Peter's life, not as we follow his life through the Gospels. He was impetuous. He was always making mistakes. But the name that the Lord gave him was a name He gave him out of love for him and described not so much what Peter was as what Peter would be, what he would make of him. Peter is a reminder of the transforming grace of our Lord, of how the Lord deals with us patiently and what He can make of us, what He can make of all of us. We see that in the next two as well, James and John. They were brothers, sons of Zebedee. The Lord called them Boanerges, which means sons of thunder, probably due to their fiery dispositions. Uh, not recorded here, but in the book of Luke you have this incident recorded where they want to call down fire from heaven on a Samaritan village because the Samaritans didn't respond properly to the Lord. Because they were unresponsive, let's incinerate them. And Jesus rebuked them for that. But the transformation is obvious in these men. James became the, became the first martyr of the church and John became known as the apostle of love who wrote in 1 John 4, 7, Beloved, let us love one another. That's a transformation. Andrew is next. He was Peter's brother, also a fisherman. Then Philip, who grew up with Andrew and Peter in uh, Bethsaida. He brought Nathanael to the Lord. That's at the end of the first chapter of John. Bartholomew is thought to be Nathaniel because the two names are often linked with, P with Philip. Uh, the Lord, you remember, called him an Israelite in whom is no guile or deceit. Well, when he came to the Lord, it wasn't as though there wasn't any guile or any deceit. That may have characterized him, but there was much more to be done, and he would make him very much a man without guile. 
Matthew, listed here, is actually Levi, the tax collector from chapter 2, verse 14. Thomas is well known for being a doubter. That was his drawback, his difficulty. Thaddeus is probably the disciple identified in John 14, verse 22, as Judas, not Iscariot. Simon is called the Zealot, which may indicate that he was a member of the party of the Zealots who were revolutionaries, really. They tried to foment rebellion against Rome. It's an interesting group of men that uh, Jesus chose and wanted to be with him. Some were fishermen, one was a tax man, another a political firebrand. All of them were chosen out of obscurity. Seven of them are still obscure, know very little about them. What we know about their lives is known really from human tradition, which may or may not be true. When the Lord called them, Tiberius Caesar was on the throne in Rome. All the world knew who he was, but only a close circle of friends knew who any of these men were. And yet today, who can name the first 12 Caesars? History professors. But children in Sunday schools around the world have memorized the names of the 12 apostles. That's what the Lord does. As Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 26, he calls not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. These are the ones he wants to be with. And these are the ones he changes. He transforms them. He uses them in the face of the powers of darkness and in spite of the world's wisdom. In fact, he uses these not many noble, not many mighty, to confound the wisdom of the world. Later, when, when Peter and John were arrested in the temple for preaching, Luke wrote in Acts chapter 4 how the men of the Sanhedrin were amazed at their confidence in speech, knowing that they were uneducated and untrained men. That's the, that's the view of the Jewish scholars. These men, who hadn't been trained in their schools, were bold and clear and decisive. What a change. Oddly, of the names listed, the last name may have been the most well-educated and well-bred of the twelve. But he certainly is the darkest, Judas Iscariot. His name, Judas, suggests that he was from Judah, the center of Jewish culture and learning. Whether he was or not, whether he was the better educated, he was obviously a man of great gift because the eleven trusted him. They made him their treasurer. They gave him great control and power. Yet he, as Mark states, betrayed him. On the table around which Augustine and his friends met in that small fellowship in North Africa, Augustine carved the words, whoever thinks that he is able to nibble at the life of absent friends must know that he's unworthy of this table. That rule guarded their fellowship and unity. Judas had the unique privilege of sitting at table with Jesus, even next to him at the Last Supper, but proved unworthy of that table and disrupted its unity. This verse and verse 6 form what we might call an inclusio, which is a literary device that refers to a passage framed or bracketed off by similar statements at the beginning and the end. At the end of the last section, verse 6, we have one bracket, as it were. At the end of this section, verse 19, we have another. In between, we have this passage on the ministry of the Lord. At the end, in verse 6, we have the Pharisees conspiring with the Herodians to destroy Christ. And at the end of the section, in verse 19, we have Judas betraying the Lord, joining that conspiracy. 
And what that does is it frames off this passage to give a picture of the world in which Jesus lived and ministered, the world into which Jesus would send his disciples, in which they would live and minister. He has called us, every believer in him, to be with him and to be his representatives in this world. But this world is a dark world. It is opposed to the truth, just as it was to the Lord. It plots to destroy us. It plots to conform us to its image, to destroy the message that we preach. That's the world into which Jesus would send his disciples, and it's the world in which we live. We need to know that, understand that, and remember Psalm 133. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. He has made us to minister together. That requires unity. Bearing each other's burdens in selfless service. And that is the reason we first must be with Him before we can serve Him, before we can serve others. The way we walk with the Lord will determine how we walk with the church and how we walk in the world. Do you want to be a good husband? Do you want to be a good father or mother, friend or worker? Be with Christ. So often I think people come to church to get some simple lessons on life. We, we speak about churches and ministers preaching to felt needs and some of the felt needs are how can I be a good husband? How can I be a good employer? How can I be a this or a that? How can I succeed in life? And they come wanting a simple formula, maybe three points to give them direction. Now that's not all bad. I'm not criticizing that, criticizing that altogether. But here's the formula for any relationship. For, for any success in life, it's this. It's be with Christ. That is the most important relationship you have in all of your relationships. It's your relationship with the Lord. If, if we neglect that, if we stumble in that, then we will fail in every relationship we have and in all of life. Because we live in a world that's hostile, as it was in the Lord's world his world, where they were plotting to kill him and Judas, his close disciple, betrayed him. That's the world in which we live. It's a world full of danger, temptation, and pitfalls. So for us to be ready for that, to be useful, we need to be walking with him. It's as we do that, as we walk with him, that he guards us and he guides us and he changes us, he transforms us. We already have his life. We have that when we're born again. We have that at the moment of regeneration and faith. And we lay hold of him and we are in him and we are in him forever. His life is in us. But over time, as we walk with him, that life increasingly controls us. It gives us joy and it makes us useful. You may feel your service is small and insignificant. But if it is a work for the Lord, regardless of how seemingly insignificant you may think it is or someone else may think it is, it isn't insignificant. It is of eternal value. He values it, even the smallest of things. And so much of life is about the smallest of things. And He can make you useful in that. He makes the obscure useful. He'll do that for us. As we grow in our relationship with Him, we grow in our unity with one another, our work increases, our influence grows, and our reward is great. Our reward for living a life of faithfulness, of simply walking with Him and knowing Him, the reward is infinite and eternal. And all of that by God's grace. He chooses and calls and we come. Well, may he draw us closer to himself. The world can't offer anything better than that. We know 
the almighty creator of all things and sustainer of all things. That is a blessing. But someone may be here without any relationship with Jesus Christ. If so, we invite you to come to him, to the light of the world, to Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. He receives all who do. He receives, a, he receives you with forgiveness and eternal life. So come to Christ and you who have, walk with him. May God help us all to do that. Why don't we stand and sing as our closing hymn number 18 in the Songs of Praise book, In Christ Alone, and then remain standing for the benediction. Father, what great truths we have just sung. In your son's death we live. No one can pluck us out of his hand. What a, what a great blessing and privilege that is. And we can walk with him every day. May we do that. We thank you for him and his death and the life he's given us. In his name we pray. Amen.